Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here, and we'll we'll get started, but continue to you know let people trickle into the room. Um, my name is Caitlin Corgan. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Ethics and Artificial Intelligence at the Technical University of Munich, as well as having the pleasure to help co-run the Responsible AI Network Africa with our amazing partners at KNUST in Ghana. And today we welcome you to our second Rain Africa event of 2022, uh, that were a kind of new format, a slightly altered format from our Rain Africa of usual events. Um, this one we're calling our Responsible AI Network Africa conversations on AI compared to our normal panel style workshops. Um, today we'll hear an in-depth uh, conversation from one speaker, Peter Otto, on advancing responsible adoption of an artificial intelligence at the local level. Dr. Peter is an experienced data, science, say a data scientist and has an extensive background in working with data and emerging technologies in, the develop, in developing contexts. Currently he is the lead on artificial intelligence and serves as the head of the data lab at the Innovation Research and Knowledge IRS Directorate at the French development agency AFD, AFD Paris, France. He leads efforts to provide advisory and actionable research on harnessing data at the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution driven by artificial intelligence for a sustainable development agenda, both broadening and deepening current actions of the group AFD. I'm very much looking forward to hearing his thoughts today. Uh, just some quick event etiquette. Before we begin, I'd like you to turn off your microphone and camera during the session. Um, at the end, we will have hopefully a very lively discussion um, and you can use the chat function or you can raise your hand if you'd like to uh, speak directly to us during the conversation. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. You can also let us know in the chat if you're experiencing some sort of technical problem. Um, with that, I give the floor uh, to Peter. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, thanks a lot, Kathleen. Um, it's, it's a privilege to to join you to have this particular conversation, and I'm pleased and honoured to be invited to share my thoughts on responsible AI um, at the local level, right? And the efforts that we can do together collectively to be able to move forward in this particular direction. I will share my, my, my screen um, right away. Um, let me know if it is visible. Yep, looks great. It's fine, right? Is that okay? Can you yes, see yes, screen? it goes ahead, yeah. Oh, okay, great, great. So today's talk will be advancing the responsible adoption of uh, AI at the local level. So Sam Peter has rightly introduced and I'm leading efforts on how we can advance the responsible adoption of emerging technologies uh, for development, uh, obviously leveraging on data and also AI for the SDGs, right? And it's good to join these conversations. So I will briefly uh, give a bit of a quick overview on some of the valued propositions of AI, uh, especially for sustainable development, uh, why this issue about local context is of importance and also share the thoughts uh, on, on how we can uh, advance the responsible uh, adoption of AI. So we all know, I mean, you joining this call simply implies that you already have an idea of what AI is all about. And uh, we live in a digital uh, world and things are actually growing. So we have digital growth and population keeps growing. Internet users are exploding, especially social media, uh, we have a lot of people using a uh, mobile network um, for banking and other, other, other services, right? So this is exploding both online and also offline, right? And uh, we've seen um, the growth in social media over the past few years. And we also have different social media actually coming to the table. And this also applies to the online media and also obviously the traditional media. Um, and that, that doesn't mean everybody is connected, right? Uh, we still have 
unconnected population, right? So how are we able to, to handle that? How do we build uh, solutions that are inclusive? How do we build solutions that can serve the population, right? So these are also questions that uh, we, 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 we're thinking about how to, how, to, how to address some of these things. So what, what it simply means is that uh, the traditional data sources that uh, we, 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 we used to use uh, from uh, national statistical institutions uh, published on data repositories like the World Bank data, uh, sensor data and all those stuff are useful. However, uh, they are non-traditional data sources that we can leverage to be able to address a lot of challenges that we face today, be it climate, be it, um, how do you call it, economic related stuff, be it linked with democracy uh, and all those stuff. I mean, we'll have time for, for I mean, further conversations on all these topics, but just to say that we now have uh, a broad scope or room of, of data sources, right? So we have the call record data um, that can be used for several applications. Uh, we have uh, obviously the social media and online media contents. Uh, there are a lot of people who scrap the internet uh, to be able to um, generate insights from internet activities. Uh, we have I mean, uh, for instance, at the AFD, which is a French development agency, we have partnerships with the space agencies, like the French space agency and also the European space, space agency, uh, to see how we can leverage on Earth observations to be able to address some of the challenges. Uh, for instance, uh, population growth, okay? Or uh, you can also uh, actually study how um, how our forestation is actually moving or biodiversity, right? So we can leverage on some of these sources and other data sources to be able to make um, proper recommendations for actionable uh, insights, right? So some of these sources have its strengths and also challenges. This is where we can leverage on, 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 on AI, right? To be able to address challenges, especially at the local level. Most often than not, uh, the data sources or the indicators that we, 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 we see uh, in, um, on, on data repositories, for instance, the World Bank, uh, some of these data sources are at the national level. Right. And even if it goes down, probably a bit of regional level, but most often than not, it's at national level. And there are certain key questions that we cannot address at local level. Uh, for instance, if, uh, if we're interested in, in, in understanding, let's say, gender based violence, right, in, uh, at Bolgatanga, which is one of the towns in Ghana or in Kumase, you know. Uh, or in other parts of Africa, in some regions. So how are we able to have indicators at this level, at this granular level? So timely data and also the coverage uh, and also the frequency of this data is really, really important for us to address some of the uh, challenges that we face or even to be able to accelerate towards the SDGs, right? So, uh, so that, that these data sources can help us to be able to do that. That means that we need to leverage on, on AI to be able to be able to handle some of these um, formats of data, size of data, and also to be able to analyze some of these data in a responsible manner. Uh, we face with so many, I mean, uh, health crises, you already know about COVID. Uh, we also have other crises that already exist before the COVID. You have inequality, you have climate, you have biodiversity, and obviously economic uh, crisis. I mean, yeah, a lot uh, of crises. Um, last, last year, we released a paper in collaborations with the NYU Governance Lab, which is a gov lab, on the emerging uses of technology for development, where we outline about the four intelligence uh, framework, right? So. This paper is actually open source, so I mean the slides can be shared to all participants uh, at the end of the event. So 
we, we talked about uh, four intelligence where AI is part. We have AI, uh, we have data intelligence, we have collective intelligence, and we have what we call the embodied intelligence. And in all these things, we say that when AI is used responsibly, when I, uh, it means that when it's designed and implemented in, an, in a responsible manner, then it can enhance so many development outputs. And for instance, situational awareness, right? Trying to find out what is happening at a particular given uh, period, right? Uh, when COVID actually started spreading, we, we noticed there were, there were a lot of partnerships, which we call data collaboratives between the public and the private sector. Let's, let's say the tech, telecom organizations, partnering with governments to be able to understand mobility patterns and to be able to understand vulnerable hotspots, right? Uh, to be able to uh, have proper resource allocations in these regions. We can also use it for new forms of assessments, uh, leveraging on AI and also F observations. We are able to assess whether, um, how do you call it, a, 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 let's say, a set building or we wanted to build schools in a particular region uh, has been done or not, right? So we can use these as new forms of assessment or whether interventions that were made were actually right, right? And, and, and that's very good. I mean, so there are a lot of uh, emerging uses of uh, AI for development and you can use it uh, to enhance uh, capabilities, very good in education. Uh, we have startups in Kenya, uh, that used uh, AI for online personalized uh, education. So uh, there are so many users of AI uh, that it's important for us to, to leverage on that. So in the paper, you will notice that we talk not only on the uh, positive value propositions, we also look, at, also look at the challenges and how to handle that and provide recommendations on moving forward. At AFD, one of the initiatives that we also leveraged on AI recently was to uh, map about 500 plus development banks, trying to find out who is financing what, right? So it was basically leveraging on annual reports and other documents to, to understand what, uh, where, what are some of the gaps in financing, uh, what we finance moves and, and, and how we can merge or, or how we can handle some of these uh, gaps, uh, financing opportunities that we haven't actually leveraged on. And then to have what we call the finance in common, uh, finance in common to be able to address some of the challenges that we have, right? So AI can be combined with obviously uh, F observations, call record data, uh, to be able to address some of the uh, issues at really granular level and also timely, right? What we observe is that there is uh, this gap, right? Uh, so there is this gap between the global north and the global south uh, in terms of AI governance uh, readiness. So, um, so the AI governance readiness considers uh, a lot of indicators that uh, we can categorize and uh, three areas. Uh, so we have the uh, data aspects, right? The data infrastructure. Uh, we also look at the government vision around that and also the tech sector, right? Um, and then under these three broad areas, you have several indicators online. So this is really available online. So, but what we observed is that there is, the regions that score uh, low AI readiness are, are, are mainly in Africa, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Uh, as at the, the time the report was done, right? And this raises a lot of co concerns, right, on, on, on that. We also notice that uh, there's this gap in AI conference publications um, that um, you, you, you notice that there's this big gap between these group and that group, right? And uh, in terms of AI conference um, publication, this might not be a very good indicator, but it sends uh, signals, right? It sends signals as to, as to where some of these conferences or top conferences on AI actually organized, right? So 
are they organized in Africa? Most often, are not. I mean, we had one that was uh, organized um, uh, in, was supposed to be organized in Addis Ababa and it was postponed based because we had uh, this COVID uh, challenge, right? But most often are not, some of these conferences are actually had, uh, held in Europe or in North America and all those stuff. So it, we, we, we have issues having um, researchers and, and domain experts and, 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 and individuals keen on AI moving from the global sub to the global north to be able to participate in conferences. Right, and and this poses a lot of questions on the current state of AI uh, that we have. Right, so the the and 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 in addition to that, uh, one 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 of the issues that we've also observed. I mean, um, Timnet. I think most of you do know her. Um, was recently. Um, I mean, it's been a while now, so one year plus, uh, fired from uh, Google, right? Because um, she released this very nice paper that was not well received by, 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 by Google and all some of these big uh, tech companies, highlighting some of the dangers of language models, right? Uh, because not only the algorithm has an issue, but the data has an issue. So in building responsible AI solutions, it's important to understand what data is being used. And some of the existing um, models, we can talk about leveraging on transfer, more, uh, transfer learning and other approaches uh, of federated learning and all those stuff, uh, in, uh, uh, leveraging on some of these approaches to be able to, to use some of these um, algorithms or building on some of the parameters that have been built by some of these algorithms. In fact, they are based on data sets that uh, most often are not, do not guarantee diversity and have encoding biasness in some of these things. So it, it, it calls on us to use some of these models uh, that exist uh, pretty and wisely, right? And, and and to be very careful not to just import models uh, that work, but really examine some of these things in detail, right? And obviously the carbon footprint of transformers with about 230 million parameters uh, of a neural network structure is, 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 is pretty high, right? So uh, it means that we need new solutions to be able to handle some of these challenges. So obviously AI has, has his very good, um, good side of the story. Uh, when used responsibly, if not used responsibly, we, 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 we do notice that we, we have challenges. For instance, uh, using it for surveillance uh, is also an, another issue. And this where um, culture and environment plays a role, right? So in some countries or in some regions of the world, uh, privacy or the issue of ethics is, is quite different. I mean, it raises the question, what is ethics? What is, you know? So uh, I remember in France when we, um, when this COVID actually started, right? Where uh, we had these contact tracing uh, applications that was well received here. But in other countries, it was quite simple. And I think it applies to other countries uh, in Europe and also in, in Africa. So how we perceive privacy, uh, it's not the same, right? So um, there's, this is also another issue on how to generalize, generalize some of these solutions. And it calls on us to try to find solutions that fit in the local context. And to do this, I'll share some of the thoughts on, on moving forward, right? And so if not used responsibly, uh, if, not used responsibly. And if we don't have really uh, social innovations on the table, we it can lead to widening the existing inequalities, right? Uh, that exist even within the country and also at the international level, right? And, and, and the issue of um, employment also comes into place. So how do we uh, prepare for the future of work, right? Given AI. Okay, so the good thing is that, I mean, we had the OECD released uh, principles, the valued principles, uh, I think there were, there were five and also recommendations for policymakers or institutions or labs 
uh, interested in building responsible AI labs or responsible AI solutions, right? And it's good that the Institute of Ethics and AI at the Technical University of Munich and also KNUST, which is my formal university, um, have come together to be able to have this conversation and have this um, responsible AI uh, network, right? Which is really, really good. So based on these valued uh, proposed, uh, principles, that counts, talks about inclusion, right? Human-centric uh, values and fairness. It talks about transparency, robustness, and accountability. All these are very important to be able to build uh, responsible AI. But how do we do that, right? How do we translate some of these principles or how do we translate some of these international standards, right, into practice, right? How do we translate some of these recommendations into practice, right? So we've observed there are a lot of uh, um, documents on, 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 on AI ethics, uh, we have a lot of documents on recommendations on AI principles and all those things that so many countries are coming up with that, but how do we translate that into practice, right? So uh, the recommendations that we noticed uh, that were, were actually filed out, which we cite, has to do with investment in AI R&D, uh, ensuring that the ecosystem of AI is pretty well. So it means ensuring that we have the right uh, talents, skill sets, and environments, and not policies that will kill uh, innovations, right? Um, we also have enabling the right environment and human uh, capacity, and also to leverage on international collaboration. So I think that's what this network is all about, where you have a collaboration between the responsible AI lab in Ghana, and also uh, that of the um, Institute of Ethics in AI in, in, in Munich, um, having a very good network and collaborations on some of these. So these, these, these are very good um, initiatives in the right directions. So how do, we, how do we do that, right? So how do we do that? So I'd like to share some thoughts, a um, few thoughts, and based on our conversations, probably uh, we will see how we can ship in some of these um, stuff. So, one, one, one of the key points um, is to create education and training programs. This is extremely important. And when I say education, um, it's not only formal education, uh, it's also vocational education, right? So the, 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 the idea here is to train people from childhood to, to any level. I mean, all citizens, should have an idea on what some of these notions and some of these concepts are all about, right? So uh, today, everybody, mostly a lot of people know how to use internet. It's, it's the same thing. How do we train them uh, to be able to understand some of these principles, right? How do we train, let's say, um, uh, let's say the, the, the grandmother or the mother who is, uh, in the informal sector, selling things at, uh, in the market, right? So in the open market. So how do we help her leverage on some of these techniques or some of these approaches to be able to boost productivity uh, in, in her line of work? How do we help farmers to be able to uh, avoid food waste in the food supply chain, right? How do we handle some of these things? So education is very important. How do we make policies if we do not understand what these concepts are all about, right? So uh, within a week, we had this uh, conference that was held in, that we hosted at AFD, which is the African Europe um, uh, policy, AI policy dialogue. And we have parliamentarians, for instance, we had a parliamentarian from, um, from Tanzania stressing that it is important that we have education and capacity building for policymakers. This is often not actually, this is something that we don't really hear often, but it's important that our policy makers, decision makers do understand what some of these are all about, right? So capacity building is very important. Uh, so it applies to politicians, it applies to company leaders. Uh, this also calls for collaborations between companies and universities. Let's say KNUST 
partnering with um, companies like, I don't know, SIC, the insurance companies, partnering with the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, partnering with uh, education, or uh, partnering with uh, Vodafone to be able to leverage on anonymous data, you know, uh, or to partner with some of these uh, companies or even create master programs uh, where some of these company leaders will come and learn some of these uh, uh, concepts on AI. So education is key uh, to moving forward. I'll, I'll place it as number one on, on, on the list. Um, and then another key point has to do with uh, having public dialogue, frequent public dialogues and promoting social innovations, right? So uh, conversations like what we have in is really, really important. Uh, but we can extend it, okay, extend it uh, to the whole population, right? So we, we can have regional dialogues on AI. We can also have national conversations on AI or open consultations on AI, right? Uh, for instance, in Ghana, I remember when this whole issue of the um, uh, e-levy came up, you, you notice that we there were a lot of consultations or town hall meetings, right? So this this can this this is really really important, and this will help identify the needs and the priorities of that region or that country or that location uh, on on issues that actually matter. For instance, if health is a key issue, right? If if access to health or uh, somebody has um, a, a a health a, a heart issue. Right, where, 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 where do I find the doctor? What's the nearest doctor, right? Um, or how do I even know that I, I, I have a serious issue? And the worst case scenario is when I don't even speak English or French, right? Uh, how, how, how do I interact, you know? So having opening dialogues is, and also promoting social innovation. So bringing everybody to the table people from different um, domains or different mindsets or cultures, right? Uh, coming to the table to be able to have a dialogue, to identify the needs that matter, to be able to identify some of the priority areas that the government or the local governing uh, authorities can place emphasis in in this particular region uh, we've noticed that we have issues on agriculture. We noticed that we need things to be able to promote women uh, entrepreneurship or women in tech in that particular region. So we really need some of these dialogues uh, at all levels, right? And I remember the 100 questions initiative that was, um, that started out with the GovLab, um, uh, trying to define the questions that matter uh, based on a particular uh, sector, right? Or based on a particular topic like gender biasness, right? Or migration, right? So we need, we need to have open dialogues and this will promote inclusion and diversity at, at all levels. Another thing is to promote investments in, um, in AI research and development. And, and there's, 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 these are areas that for instance, we are at an AFD, or uh, I myself, I'm actually promoting, I'm, I'm, I'm keen on supporting initiatives around that, right? So, uh, for instance, I, I know the Ghana NLP um, uh, re recently released a uh, Kenya app, an application that is built on local language uh, that I think it's worth uh, supporting or worth even applauding. So, I think this from uh, they, this is from the University of Cape Coast and other researchers in Ghana uh, and, and, and obviously in Africa trying to build uh, solutions that leverage on local languages, uh, obviously building, uh, building adequate language data sets, which is extremely important to be able to boost inclusion, right? Some of the applications that we have like Siri, uh, Amazon, Alexi, and all those stuff, I mean, uh, most of these solutions are bold, uh, not for the local context, right? So we need solutions that people understand, right? Uh, they can interact with banks, they can interact with insurance companies, and 
also access public services, uh, even if they don't speak some of these languages, right? Even if they don't speak English, right? So uh, we, we need to invest in experimentation. So our local governments have to also put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, that calls for a lot of public-private partnerships uh, collaborating. I, I actually recommend the universities partner with the private sector uh, to be able to, to build solutions that will help answer some of the key questions that they're facing. We have other initiatives that, that, that are currently going. I mean, we know about the Indaba X, uh, we also know uh, Masican. Um, these are all very good initiatives. And these, these are just a few, uh, right? But it is important for especially academic institutions or private sector that that are keen on R&D and the area of AI to be able to see how to move from the lab to the market, right? So, so we actually need to be able to support that, right? Not just have uh, innovations, but how do we move it to the market? How do we even commercialize some of these uh, solutions, right? So, so that's one. And then another key point, so the first part I talked about education uh, and then the second part, open dialogues and social innovation. Uh, another key area, I'm also looking at the time so that I don't go past the time. Um, another key area um, to look into has to do with supporting uh, open data initiatives or open data sharing um, initiatives like data trust, right? Or how do we build data infrastructure, right? So in, in building responsible AI solutions at the local level, it is uh, one, one of the key things is to be able to get access to data, right? To be able to build the right data infrastructure, to be able to have the right uh, enabling environments that will facilitate the sharing of data. We know most often than not data that we need to be able to address some of the challenges at a timely manner are held by the private sector, right? So how, 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 how will the private sector share some, some of these data sources, right? Uh, in a responsible way. So it means that we, 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 we really need what we call data stewardship, right? So we need to train people to understand uh, how, 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 how this can be done. So we need data stewardship. We need um, data literacy. So that's why education is also pretty important, right? So we need for us to have a responsible AI, which is obviously based on having responsible data solutions and obviously uh, having a, uh, have, bringing together the data providers, so the, the data owners, we have the experts and we also have uh, the demand side, so the domain. What 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 questions are we trying to to answer? So so in doing all these things, um, this will help us to be able to uh, have responsible AI solutions, right? So we need proper data stewardship and literacy in this particular area. We need to have uh, ways in which we can collaborate with the private or data owners for public good. Right, so how do we facilitate some of these uh, data, data sharing uh, approaches? There are a lot of frameworks that are available uh, that can be leveraged upon, right? And, and that's why the open dialogue and social innovations also help to be able to have the right uh, environment to get this done, right? So we had the Data for COVID initiative that was, um, that was basically to do that, like, how do we leverage on non-traditional data sources uh, to be able to address uh, or to have actionable insights for to address some of the challenges um, on, 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 on COVID, right? So we had excellent researchers that joined uh, a team in Senegal from, uh, from the Institute of Ethics on AI. I, I remember Axen and Ellen, if I'm, Ellen, uh, if I'm not mistaken, who are also on the team and they did a great job, right? So these, these, these are some of the things that I think can promote responsible um, AI solutions in that context. Another area, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm still, I still have ample time. So another area has to do with enabling effective data policy and 
national AI strategies, right? So, uh, for instance, um, we 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 had we had a, a session. We 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 had a partnership, AFD had partnership with the Lawyers Hub. Um, we supporting the African Law Tech Festival uh, this year. Uh, we started in Nairobi and um, to Paris and other 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 locations, and how how do we bring uh lawyers and uh, uh, how do we bring lawyers uh policy makers uh technocrats and other domain experts to be able to have effective strategies on data and also on ai right so uh, on this side, we we had talks uh from the um i remember the ghana data protection uh commission i mean the head or the executive director of that, who is also leading efforts at the African Union. And you, you notice that um, the African Union actually released the, um, are, are still working, uh, they have an initial draft, they are still working on the African, um, African Union data policy, right, continental data policy, which I think is very, very key. But it also raises a lot of questions uh, as to whether uh, most of these countries or, or most of these countries are actually ready, they, they have the right talent, they right, have the right capacity to be able to adapt such policies. In, in a way, it is also very important to have such policies because it's, it serves as a very good benchmark for uh, different countries, I'm talking about Africa, different countries to pick some of these policies and see how they can adapt it to their, their, their context and you know, align it to the national priorities or regional priorities um, on that, right? So these, these, these are ways we, we really need some of these enabling environments. And for us to have enabling environments, we need the right policies and we need uh, obviously an AI strategy. I remember when, I think in 2018 or so, when the consolidated plan uh, for AI was launched in Europe, uh, after the launch of that, we noticed that there was a, an up, upspring of a lot of AI strategies, uh, especially in the global north, right? So these can serve as very good benchmark uh, or, or, uh, to be able to build uh, data and AI strategies, right? So in, in enabling effective uh, AI national strategies, uh, that can be a very good benchmark to be able to have responsible AI uh, initiatives. And, and that being said, in, in having that, we need what we have, we, we, we need adaptive regulations. What we notice is that there've been uh, the growth of AI uh, is, 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 is still exploding, right? Um, quite recently, we had what we call the federated learning, which is privacy by default AI neural approach, right? So a privacy preserving AI approach, right? So we have federated learning, but we have other approaches or other techniques that are actually now being built, right? Uh, like um, causal machine learning. I mean, there are so many new things that are being built. Um, and it means that we, we, we need to find ways, we, we have to adapt to these changes, right? And not have static policies or static regulations. So for us to be able to do that, we also need policy makers or decision makers to be able to understand what all these things are about. So this calls for a multi-stakeholder approach, right? A multi-stakeholder approach. So it means that we need individuals from the academic sector, research institutions, the private sector, the civil society, which is very key to be able, so citizens participation and the civil sector, the civil society to come together, to be able to have a dialogue on ways in which we can have um, proper uh, responsible AIs, uh, environment and solutions, right? So leveraging on international collaborations it's also very, very key because we we learn uh, we learn based on what others have done 
What are some of the lessons learned? What are some of the opportunities? What have been the challenges, right? And, and, and this is a way of moving forward. Uh, I, I actually like the first talk of this uh, series where we invited um, researchers from, I think, Uganda, Burkina Faso, and Ghana to have a conversation, right? So uh, do, we, do we see differences between the Anglophone and the Francophone uh, uh, in line with some of these approaches, right? So uh, that, that is very, very key. So the use of tax force is also very key. Uh, so the tax force means that we're bringing every um, sector on the table, so civil society, academic institutions, um, from private, from public, and also policymakers on the table to have a conversation. And the use of tax force has proven to be very useful in, 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 in some of the countries that have released and are still working in this particular uh, direction. Right. So in, in summary, uh, the key thoughts, um, thoughts that I'd like to share, the first one has to do with the need to uh, boost education and training programs. Uh, so how, I don't know how, how, but, uh, how, how it can be done in a particular, like I know how we can do it, but it depends based on the dialogue that uh, some uh, the, the countries will have with the citizens and also with the private and public uh, or labs, uh, then can have programs, right? So programs and vocational programs to be able to help educate politicians, uh, gov governance board citizens uh, through open dialogue. And this will boost trust because it's important to engineer trust. It's also important to build the right talents because if people do not understand, then that, that raises a lot of eyebrows. So dialogue is very, very important. Identifying the needs that matter in the local context is extremely important. Social innovation, uh, leveraging on collective intelligence. And I know Nesta uh, is, is, is also working on this particular area. And then investing in R&D, in research around that experimentation and partnership between universities, partnership between universities and companies, uh, partnership within universities and donor organizations are also very, very key. Uh, they need to have responsible data governance, uh, opening up data sharing approaches, uh, having the right data infrastructure is also very key. And I think in moving forward also, it's important to have effective national AI strategies or, 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 or data strategies to be able to do that. And it's important that some of these uh, strategies actually adapt with the evolution of uh, the technology and leveraging on international collaboration is so very, very key to have lessons learned. I will be ending soon with some initiatives that are worth considering. Um, for instance, uh, the GovLab actually started this AI localism. So how do we have the responsible design and use of AI at the local level? So some cities have started using that. Um, a city of Berkeley in California. We've had other cities, Amsterdam, who are also trying to use AI at a very sub-national level to be able to address some of the challenges that they face. So we, there's a repository that is actually available. And I know that uh, the Technical University of Munich actually also worked with the GovLab to have the AI localism uh, canvas, okay? So a framework that enables to be able to access the emergence of the governance of AI within cities, right? So in Ghana, you have the uh, AMA, Accra Metropolitan Assembly, and then you have some of these. And so how are we able to leverage on some of these uh, initiatives or inspire or collaborate with some of these institutions to move forward in these directions? Um, I've been working uh, with the other groups of experts at, uh, at the OECD experts on AI. Uh, we actually released the OECD framework for classification of AI system, looking at it from all angles on the economic context, uh, having people at the center and the planet, uh, also looking at the model, looking at the data inputs and also some, some of the outputs. Uh, there's still work ongoing 
uh, on how we can build risk profiles on AI systems. And this can also help policymakers to be able to, and also almost everybody to be able to classify AI systems. Because uh, we notice some AI systems are being used for recruitment, which has also its issues. And lastly, there is this AI, OECD AI observatory that has a lot of resources in that direction. So I'll end here and I will leave it back to Kathleen to, to continue. I hope, I hope that's fine with you. Yeah, Thank you. great. Thank you, Peter, so much. That was a really um, great presentation and a lot, a lot there. So please, everyone, uh, either use the chat or uh, just use your raise your hand function if you um, have want to help get this discussion going. We have about 15 minutes to, to, to talk with Peter. Um, and I was really excited to see some of the uh, our projects and our projects that we've worked on with other RAIN members mentioned throughout there. Um, I, I mean, as you're talking, I kept coming back to this concept of seeing more and more of grassroots AI and grassroots AI governance. And you're talking about the importance of national strategies and policies, not just for um, promoting innovation, but also promoting ethical AI and responsible use of AI and how and and also the the fact that you mentioned that I mean there's a lot of ethical frameworks out there yeah. on AI, but a lot of them are also positioned kind of in the global north, right? And come out of that or either the private sector. So what about kind of engaging in the the ethics discussion at the grassroots level as well? And what can that look like? I mean, you mentioned kind of different dialogues, but more in in a maybe academic setting or, or these kind of policy forums, but what about you know the farmer or the person in the marketplace that you mentioned as well? How do you actually get in there and get them to trust AI or figure out what, what ethic all AI means to them? Very good, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so so, so that's, that's why we actually need these training and vocational uh, programs in, in, that, in, that, in that respect. Some, what what I know that works is when people when when you uh, provide individuals with the valued propositions of AI, the current use cases, uh, what others have used, right? If we're able to show to them that when you leverage on AI, when you leverage on some of these approaches, you are able to boost your productivity, reduce cost. Once you are able to explain. Um, the value added on leveraging on some of these technologies, uh, then people people are open to listen, right? So what? So so the, the first the, the first part is to try and show use cases, try and show ex examples, right, on how they can leverage on that. So got most of them are not when we say AI, people think about it as something that is meant for academic institutions or actually meant for the geeks, if I'll put it that way, right? So um, like, okay, it's only for those people who could, but no, we actually need everybody. We need everybody, even in, um, in a team working on AI, we need everybody. We need a behavioral scientist. We need somebody who has nothing to do with AI to come and put something on the table. So. Showing them use cases, I think that's 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 a great way uh, to move forward in that direction. So, uh, so these use cases should be sector specific, and I think that will help. That will help stimulate the conversation, right? So, if we have forums that are open to the public, and we tell them, okay, this is actually going to be focused in agriculture. Come and learn and see how we can leverage. Uh, on some of these approaches to boost your productivity and reduce costs, I think people are rushing for that, right? And, and also, so, so that's for the, those, those working in both formal and informal sector, because sometimes people do not know that they can leverage on these, right? So when we show them that others have done that and it's doable, then they are open to listen. And um, for parliamentarians, I think this is really, really key. What I notice is that when people do not understand certain things, they place policies, right? They, they just put laws because they don't understand, right? Uh, it's the same thing that happens with uh, DLTs, right? So uh, distributed ledger take, don't like blockchain related stuff, right? If people don't understand cryptocurrencies, they put legislations on, on, on that, right? So. 
it is important that we have education uh, on that. And this cuts across all levels. So primary school, uh, I mean, we can explain AI in a simple manner that everybody will understand, right? So teaching, teaching machines to learn from examples, right? So if you're like, hey, baby boy, AI is about teaching machines to learn from examples. So this is my phone, this is, this is a phone, and this is not a phone. Uh, so I'm going to teach the machine to be able to distinguish between these. Like, and it, it tells me that the probability that it is a phone is this percentage. So what are the things that we can use that for? So mm -hmm. it, the kids will now start thinking, oh, I can use that to be able to do this. You, you start generating ideas, right? Based on that, right? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can have a model to see whether mom is happy and mom is not happy, you know? So when I do something, you know? So when I do something, these are my inputs and whether mom is going to be happy or not will be my outputs, you know? So when we, when we give them, when we educate them, then you, it will lead to stimulate innovations, right? In that direction, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, your your the the mention of the the uh, you know getting parliamentarians involved and 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 looking to that too made me think of um, methods we've seen in other areas like when when there's vaccine campaigns or other things like that of the importance of getting kind of local leaders involved because that's who the people look to and trust for information yeah. um, at, you know anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot probably we can learn from you know how things have been implemented in other areas. Kathleen, what you're saying is very important. And we noticed on one of the projects uh, on data for COVID, I think that was a Nigeria team, uh, also noticed that religious leaders are very influential. And uh, so lead religious leaders as one means that if we also educate some of these leaders, right, uh, on, on, on some of these notions, uh, that is also another way of of, 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 of actually bringing people to know that some of these approach can help them in their livelihood. Yes. Great. Uh, so we had a question on uh, specifically on applications for AI in the field of education. And I had kind of a, a similar example of um, this kind of lack of applicable data or data quality that you were talking about. We had a talk from someone who works in the UNICEF Office of Innovation. And they okay. were giving the example of how you showed that map of, of, of uh, satellite imagery data and how you can use it all over the world and how you can really uh, you know, exemplify or, or rely on it to, to, to get a lot of information. But they were saying, for instance, an educational building looks really different in rural Africa than what the, the satellite imagery programs are trained on, right? Of what a, a school should look like. So how do we actually, um, related to how you can use it for education, how do we actually get the data that'll help these tools be useful? Is it about ground truthing? Do you have to send people out there and, and have them be labeling um, what schools in rural Africa look like compared to in you know, Germany, for example? This, this is excellent. Uh, so, so on the education example, uh, it was mainly on how do you, let's say, um, donor organization or development organizations detect whether a particular project has been done at that given location, right? Um, we also, leveraging on F observation, um, there's, there's the, the other initiatives that leverage on drones, uh, the place. Uh, so this, this is an organization, NGO, um, they are changing their statutes more like an independent research organization. It's called this place, right? So it's more on data sharing approaches using drones, right? So we have the F observations on top, but they also have aerial view, right? Uh, to be able to study uh, what is actually happening because sometimes when you take uh, the images on top, uh, like you talked about, it's not the same from one country to another, right? So um, so that, that, is, that is really important. And it also talks about how to label some of these data, right? Annotation of these data. So on education, we can leverage AI in education at all levels. So it, it could be on how do we have personalized learning uh, for students, right? How do we personal, have personalized learning? And then we can leverage on AI and other approaches to be able to move forward. So not only on AI, but leveraging on, let's say, 
citizen science or um, participatory tools, right? So you have the smart crowdsourcing, right? So people can actually use some of these uh, staffs to be able to uh, understand what is happening in a particular area, right? So we have personalized learning. We can also have it as a means of security to check whether all the students are available. Where are they, right? We can also use it to uh, boost performance of students, okay? So if we understand, if we are able to understand the factors that are leading to low performance in some subjects or in some uh, yeah, in some subject areas, uh, we try to understand the underlying factors. Uh, so you can leverage on AI based on data you have to be able to make such recommendations. So um, yeah, there are a lot of use cases uh, that we can learn on that. Yeah. Great. Um, so we're almost out of time. I have I had one more question. I saw uh, as I was looking through your work and and your work with the the Gov Lab as well. In an article in the conversation, there was mention of the fact that emerging technologies and AI are not always appropriate in all situations, right? Um, they need to be considered alongside existing methods, and maybe sometimes there are less technical methods that are more efficient or better for the environment or whatever. Do you have examples from your experience where kind of you've seen this? Very, very good. So, so like I said, AI, AI uh, emerging technologies can be used um, uh, can be used for different purposes, but not all situations. So, let's say if you want to um, use uh, AI, right? If you want to use AI and you are interested in increasing, uh, let's say. Um, social networks, right, or increasing social capacity and networks, then AI's impact will be much less than uh, using smart crowdsourcing, right, or using uh, crowd, yes, yeah, smart crowd uh, approaches, right. So some of these technologies that um, leverages on uh, individual participatory approaches, right. So AI might not be the best solution to do that. Uh, you can use other uh, simple technologies that will help you to do that. Uh, for instance, um, so, so, so for instance, if you are interested in uh, trying to check um, the yield productivity, agricultural pro productivity, right? So agricultural productivity, you can leverage on other technologies. So not only on AI, you can leverage on what we call the embodied intelligence. So leveraging on drones. Uh, so you can have drones and AI to be able to do that. And probably you might not need collective intelligence to do that, right? So, so depending on the purpose, then we need the right technology or the right mix of that. So it has to be fit for purpose. Uh, I've had requests, okay, slightly confidential, but I've had requests from some, uh, some, some ministries or some countries uh, saying, okay, blockchain is out, it's excellent, it can boost transparency, we would like to use that, right? So should we finance such an initiative? So questions come, I mean, you, we have some initiatives like that. And then I'm like, if you want to boost transparency, the other approaches that you can use, you can leverage on open data, right? You don't need AI to do that, right? So you can use open data, you can use, you really need to work on your governance, data governance approach, right? So AI might help you address certain things, uh, but not all, all steps, right? So it's understanding the purpose uh, and then aligning it with uh, the right technology or the right mix of, of, of technology. It's, it's more like cooking. So you need to write, put, put in the right ingredients to be able to have uh, a, a very good and tasty meal that is good for the health, right? So, so it's just the right mix and knowing what to use at a given time. Yeah, agree. Um... We are running out of time, so thank you for, for the great discussion. Um, I want to take a final moment to remind you that the best way to stay up to date with our events is to visit our website. I'll put it all in the chat here. Subscribe to our newsletter. Follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. 
Um, and I would, and also check out the Rain Africa repository, which I'll put all the um, information in the chat as well for that. So uh, I would like to again thank Peter for accepting Rain Africa's invitation to come to our conversations on AI, and all of you for joining us and and the great discussion and uh, questions and comments. Um, so uh, we look forward. Uh, I will be posting this online and and with uh, the slides as well that Peter gave us. So uh, you can all check it out there or forward it whoever you want, because I think this is really, really informative. So thanks again, Peter, and thank you all. And we'll see you at the next Great Africa event.